So what I want to do is, is actually talk a little bit more about potential human applications um, and uh, so more of the scientific vision. And I'll mention a few things along the way about, um, uh, about some well, ethic, questions of ethics and regulation, um, uh, just to, to get you thinking. But I'm going to start by a little, uh, by saying um, this, which is, uh, as a scientist, I would be failing my duty if I didn't suggest what might um, become possible with these techniques. Um, that includes some applications involving um, heritable germline alterations uh, that might be achievable in the near future. Others will be a long way off or, or may never be possible. However, just because I am voicing these suggestions does not mean that I advocate that they should be done. Right? Um, uh, not only does our scientific uh, knowledge fall short in, in certainly many of the more provocative uh, examples, um, but the decision as to whether to go ahead with any specific application is not one for scientists or clinicians to make alone. So it, that has to involve society. So my little qualifier there. Okay. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention is that I was part of this um, uh, a National Academies of Sciences of the U.S. Um, study group that published this report just about a year ago, just over a year ago, uh, February the 14th last year, um, where, which was a committee made up of about 22 people. Uh, unlike most national, U.S. National Academy committees, this one had quite a, a, a big in, international membership with about half the, the members coming from or, and living, or living in other countries. Um, and it was a very um, a broad group with, with different, different views, perspectives. Um, uh, it was a very interesting process. Uh, to make progress in our discussions, we, it was necessary to come up with a set of ov overarching principles uh, for talking about the governance of human genome editing. Um, and then this also informed the way we wrote the report and is an important part of the conclusions. So if you're going to do any of this, uh, you, you need to sort of stick to these principles, which are obvious principles, um, are very common in, in any form of, of medicine. So promoting well-being, due care, transparency, responsible science, um, re respect for persons, fairness, transnational cooperation. Um, we've got, if you look in our report, um, which is a very good read, by the way, um, uh, we go into this in much more detail for each of the so many of the specific um, topics on, around genome editing. <clears throat> so there are three um, major applications of genome editing with human cells. So that's uh, basic research, uh, purely laboratory work on cells um, uh, and tissues. Uh, you've got, and then there are two clinical ap ap types of application. So there is somatic or non-heritable alterations in DNA um, in patients uh, to treat or prevent disease. And then there's germline or heritable uh, interventions, again, to treat or prevent disease. So I'm going to start off with the, the basic research angle because this is sort of Im important. Um, so these are experiments, if you like, to understand uh, human biology. That can be done in the lab. They can be done in vitro. Um, so you can study the role of specific genes, um, actually in, in different contexts using different human cells. These methods can be used to make a, make a mutation or to correct a, a mutant gene in a patient-specific cell line, including these so-called induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, um, these iPS cell lines, so they correspond to a very early embryo-like cell, so in the lab, you can make them differentiate, specialize into many different cell types that we, you would find in the body. So they're a very powerful way of studying uh, diseases and how they develop in humans. So we, we have a, a big deficiency of knowledge, certainly for, for diseases that arise during embryonic development, but using these cells allows, allows you to get some relevant information. You can also use these, these cells for screening for drugs for conventional treatments. So they are very powerful. Um, 
And then uh, you can do other things. You can, um, you can have organ-specific stem cells which you can use. So stem cells from the gut, for example, which you can grow in culture and model aspects of, of, of gut development or function. Um, the, you can make uh, little organoids corresponding to a whole variety of, of different tissues now uh, and study the role of genes in, in that context. So it's not just a simple cell culture. It's actually three-dimensional structures with characteristics of, of human organs in the lab. Um, you can make actually quite complex tissues from these cells, um, uh, brain-like structures, um, eye-like structures, kidney-like structures. So you can study really quite complex aspects of human development and um, physiology. Um, okay. So if you can do all of this uh, with, with, with human cell lines in the lab, why not also use the techniques to study early human embryo development um, and other germline cells. Um, so a, a lot of what we know about early mammalian development comes from studies in the mouse. Um, so on the top um, is the first few days of mouse development. On the bottom is the first few days of, of, of human embryo development. Um, they start off looking very similar, but there are differences already in terms of the timing of events. Timing is when cells divide, when the genome starts to be, the new genome starts to become active, for example. Um, as you go later, and, and so up, up to this, this point is all pre-implantation development, and then on this, the, the diagrams on the extreme right are shortly after the embryo is implanted in, in, in the uterus. Now you see very distinct differences. The organization of the embryos look very different. It's the blue cells, by the way, that are going to give rise to the, um, the, the embryo proper and ultimately the, the, the child born or uh, the baby mouse born. Um, so the, the structure looks very different. And there are even different cell types. So for example, the cells on the outside, which are going to give rise to the trophectoderm, which gives rise to much of the placenta. Um, in, in the mouse, you have a population of cells called trophoblast giant cells that are very important for interacting with the, 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 the tissue of the uterus, the, the lining of the uterus. In the human, there's no such cell, but they have a different cell type called uh, syncytiotrophoblast, which does the same thing. So there are many differences, just morphologically. If you start looking at gene activity, so you look at um, gene, genes, gene expression, just looking at RNA made by genes, for example, uh, or proteins, you find many, many differences. And those differences include genes and pathways that we know are essential for early mouse development, but those are inactive. They're not working at all in the early human development. So there have to be different genes involved in early human development. Um, uh, okay. um, we know, well, from all the work done with IVF, it seems that uh, humans are very inefficient when it comes to reproducing. You wouldn't think that with, what, well, 7 billion of us on the planet, but we're actually not very good. So if you start with the fertilized egg, actually only about 12.5% would actually, have a, actually give you a, a child at the end. And in many cases, you have a failure uh, in during very early development. Uh, about half fail to meet this so-called blastocyst stage that's uh, able to implant. Uh, and then of those, about half fail shortly after implantation. Um, and in many cases, it's not known why. So um, my colleague at the Francis Crick Institute, Kathy Narkin, has been interested in these differences between human and mouse embryos and in... Um, trying to find out more about the biology of the early human embryo, uh, understanding that biology might allow improvements in IVF techniques um, and uh, perhaps deal with this high rate of loss of, of, of embryos. Um, so she wanted to um, do proof of principle experiments to ask the role of a specific gene um, initially, 
which is a gene called OCT4. Don't worry about it, but it's, uh, it's a gene that uh, act, it's a transcription factor. It, its role is to activate, turn on many other genes. And it's expressed at the blastocyst stage in just the small group of cells that are going to go on to give rise to the embryo proper. Um, but actually, in the human embryo, it's expressed in, in all the cells of the blastocyst earlier. Um, in the mouse, we know what this gene does in its role. And so she wanted to say, well, is it really got the same role in the, in the human embryo? Um, so, um, sorry. Her experiments, I should say, are all just of these focused on these pre-implantation stages of human development. So um, one cell, two cell, uh, four cell, uh, eight cell, 1632 cell, and then the oh, that's an early blastocyst on, on the bottom right. Um, so she used, I'm not going to go into any more detail on this, but she used the genome editing methods, uh, used CRISPR-Cas9. She tested out all the components thoroughly uh, in cell lines and in mouse embryos first, uh, chose the most efficient ways of doing this, um, and uh, used the, the genome editing methods to inactivate, make mutations in this OCT4 gene. Um, and if you look, um, the top sort of darker blue, li dark blue line is essentially the control. So this is showing that um, you get about 50% of the embryos control embryos that were injected with just the Cas9 enzyme, but not the guide RNA, uh, made it to blastocyst stages. And that's the same rate that you would get if you'd done nothing at all in, in early human embryos in, in culture. You get 50% going to blastocyst. When she injected the, the guide RNA and the Cas9 together, um, the numbers that reached sort of blastocyst stages were only about 20, 25%. So many of them were not, were failing to get that far. Um, and it turned out that those that failed to even reach blastocyst stages, uh, the old 4 gene had been inactivated in all cells in the embryo. And this basically showed that of the old 4 protein acts earlier than it does in the mouse, and probably in these trophics, the cells on the outside, uh, as well as the cells on the inside. So there's a difference between mouse and human. Those that did make it to blastocyst stages didn't do so very well. They, checked, they kept sort of trying to make a blastocyst and then collapsing and trying again and collapsing. And it turned out in these cases, the genome ed editing methods had worked, but not in all cells. So there were always one or two or a few cells that were still expressing, still had an active old 4 gene. So that was enough to sort of make them limp towards making a, a, a blastocyst, um, but not actually go any further. So um, there are lots of details about this, which I'm not going to go through. If anyone's interested, I can tell you. But she established methods to make this um, very efficient. She felt she had to because she didn't have many embryos to work with. And of course, they're, they're valuable in, a, in many ways. Um, she looked to see how accurate the genome editing was. Did she just get the mutation in the OCT4 gene, or were there other so-called off-target um, events? Uh, from her analysis, they could find no evidence of any off-target events anywhere. And it was a, a th pretty thorough analysis. So it was very accurate. Um, if she compared when she, she took Thorough, you know, there were thorough detailed records of every single embryo manipulated. And she knew that if the egg had been injected at a, a sort of an, an early stage, so this is obviously these are fertilized eggs, but um, the fertilized egg undergoes a well characterized progression up to the point where then it starts dividing to make a two, two cells. Uh, she knew if she'd injected fairly early on, the genome editing was much more, was more efficient, and that's when she inactivated the gene in all cells. Uh, if she had injected a little bit later, that's when she got these so-called mosaic embryos where some cells had the mutated gene and others didn't. <clears throat> so this was the, so the first time that genome editing had been used to study gene function uh, in human embryos. And it revealed an important function for this gene OCT4, 
uh, for the differentiation of these outer so-called trophector dumb cells in addition to its role in the um, inner cells which are going to go on and give rise to the embryo. Um, so she would, we would argue, she would argue that um, studying the role of genes in um, during human development will advance our understanding of human biology. Um, in turn, that knowledge could lead to improvements in uh, actually in stem cell biology, because people, of course, want to study, uh, one way of studying early human development is to derive embryonic stem cells and perhaps other stem cells from the early embryo. Uh, also, perhaps help improve IVF and ways to understand and prevent some causes of miscarriage, but using methods that don't involve genome editing at all. If you can find there's a particular pathway of gene activity that's critical for early human development, and you can manipulate that just by changing the culture medium, um, you know, changing a, re, you know, a component that you've added, then uh, that would be of great benefit. So are there any um, cons, anything against um, research using genome editing on early human embryos in vitro? I personally think not. Um, as long as the work is conducted well and with appropriate um, ethical approval and oversight. Um, genome editing used in this context is exactly the same as any other type of, you know, as using any other type of method on an early human embryo which is going to be kept in vitro and never implanted in a woman. So it's, it's, it's not doing anything that's, that's, that's worse, uh, in my view, than, than any other, t other technique. Um, so it's not it's no, no different, really, from other research that's, that has led itself to in vitro fertilization, IVF, and methods such as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD. Um, I think Kathy's work was set a standard of how this work should be done, uh, and that included openness. So the whole process was open. Uh, you can find all her consent documents, all her approvals um, available, are all available online. Um, there are other concerns that people would raise. Um, so it might be, to do this type of research, necessary to create embryos specifically for research purposes. And there are several reasons for that. It's difficult to obtain now one-cell embryos, fertilized eggs, for research because actually many IVF clinics now culture embryos um, for several days often up to the blastocyst stage, and then choose which embryos to implant, which means there are relatively few available uh, at the early enough stage. Um, it might be very important to know exactly in the experiment when fertilization took place, so you, you can only control it if you've done it uh, in the lab. Um, and actually, to make it more efficient, as Cathy's results already suggested, the earlier you, you do it, the better. And uh, perhaps the best time to do it, uh, introduce the genome editing components, if you want it to be in all cells, is at the time of fertilization. IVF clinics now mostly use so-called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where you inject a sperm into the unfertilized egg to fertilize it. You can simply introduce the components at the same time. Um, Another thing that people, of course, question people raise is, well, of course, this could use to a, <clears throat> a very significant increase in the number of human embryos used for research. There are many genes you could study. Um, that's one reason why uh, we feel, and Cathy feels, that it's important to um, uh, share intentions as well, as, well as, as well as results so that there's, not, there's no duplication, certainly. Um, Others, concerns that people have, it might lead to an extension of the so-called 14-day rule. So currently we're allowed, uh, many jurisdictions are allowed to work on human embryos up to 14 days in culture. But if you could culture them beyond that, there's many more interesting things you could do. And so, uh, but there's, a, there's pressure to, to alter that rule anyway. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, improved efficiency of doing these types of experiment in early human embryos uh, may facilitate attempts to uh, uh, use the methods clinically to make heritable changes. Um, uh, <clears throat> of course, for the type of research that my colleague Cathy's been doing, 
it would have been unethical not to use the most efficient methods, otherwise it would, she'd have been wasting embryos. Um, and then, as we'll get into, would it be wrong anyway to make heritable um, genetic changes? Um, so let's go to the clinical uses. So somatic therapy, I'm going to cover this fairly quickly. Um, I mean, I've read um, the, the, the document, and there seems to be a general uh, thought that somatic genome editing is, is probably mostly a good thing. Um, there are two ways of doing it. You can take cells out of the body, for example, bone marrow stem cells, manipulate those outside the body, um, make your desired change, check you have it, and then reintroduce them back into, into the patient. Um, and that method is being used already in several clinical trials or clinical trials about to start, for example, for treating or trying to treat patients with sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia. As an example, um, you can also contemplate directly altering genes in the body. That is more challenging technically because you have to have an efficient way of delivering the genome editing components. So, mostly people are not always, but mostly people are thinking of using uh, types of viruses that have been developed for somatic gene therapy and. Um, incorporating the genome editing components into those viruses and then infecting the relevant cell types within the body. Um, there are attempts to do that, and uh, I think there will be some clinical trials launched um, fairly soon to, to do that. But there are issues of safety there, whenever you, particularly whenever you're using a, a vector like a viral vector. Um, you have to be, be worried. Um, I'm going to raise the thorny issue of enhancement at this point. We'll come back to it later because, um, of course, you can use somatic um, genome editing to enhance a, an individual in some way. Um, you could, in, in fact, I mentioned this sort of garage science community, the, the um, biohacker community. There are a couple of people already trying to improve their muscle size by inactivating a gene called myostatin, injecting their muscles with um, CRISPR-Cas9 to that. They're crazy, absolutely crazy. It's not going to work. They're going to cause themselves damage, I think. But um, you could, in theory, uh, do it properly and enhance muscle mass. In, uh, for an athlete, you could uh, um, boost uh, production of erythropoietin, so you have more oxygen carried in your blood and things. There are ways you could do enhancement somatically. But, of course, it raises significant public concern about fairness uh, if it's available only to some groups, uh, about creating pressure to seek out enhancements. Um, uh, but, of course, we have to balance it with the fact that many other types of enhancement we already tolerate in, in, in our societies. Um, but the range, at the, at least at the moment, of possible uh, approved therapies for enhancement um, uh, seems rather limited, um, and um, I guess our, um, our, our National Academy study came out very strongly um, against uh, forms of enhancement. So this is making changes beyond ordinary um, human capacities um, or anything outside of uh, treatment or prevention of disease and disability. Um, So uh, enhancement is unlikely to offer uh, benefits sufficient to, to justify the current risks of doing the genome editing. It's another important factor. So we decided they should not proceed. Um, uh, sh genome editing should not be extended to purposes other than treatment or prevention of disease, uh, without it, certainly not without extensive public um, input. So now we get to the, the more thorny issue of genome editing, making heritable changes, so so-called germline um, interventions, to treat or prevent disease. Um, I just point out, of course, I'm sure many, some of you know this, that the human genome is not static. Um, every generation there are 40 to 80 uh, base pair changes in, in the genome. It actually depends on how old the father is to quite a large extent. So older fathers have produce children with twice as many mutations as younger fathers. Um, um, 
Given the size of the genome, uh, that's not many changes to make in, in, in the genome. Um, so it seems very small. But, um, of course, these changes have, over many uh, thousands of years, contributed to the human variation we see around us, um, and consequently to selection for specific traits um, during our evolution. Um, and it, it also contributes to the burden of disease. Uh, genetic disease particularly, of course, um, and I'm not going to go into these, but you all know all of this. The burden of disease is enormous, and as, as mentioned, um, there are probably 400 million people um, suffering from some form of in inherited genetic disease. So what can we do about this? How about deliberately altering our genes and genomes? Can we avoid genetic disease in our children? Certainly not always. We can do nothing about spontaneous or so-called de novo mutations, we, which you can't predict are going to happen. You could only deal with this in a case, a case where you could predict that a child might be affected. Um, <clears throat> and then the thorny quest questions about could we genetically enhance ourselves or our children? Can we alter our over evolution? Um, and should we do any of these, which you're going to be debating? So two possible methods. The first, so I mentioned it's possible to um, manipulate spermatogonial stem cells. Um, so one possible method is to manipulate um, the precursors of eggs and sperm. So for, for males, it's relatively simple, as I said, to get spermatogonial stem cells and manipulate those. Um, the advantage of this is that you can verify that you have the edit you want, wanted to make and no others in the cells before you use them to generate sperm with which you're going to fertilize an egg. So you, you know what you've done uh, in advance. Um, and as I said, this has been done uh, through um, with spermatogonial stem cells. It's also been done through this longer process of deriving induced pluripotent stem cells from, from an animal um, uh, and then manipulating those and then turning those ultimately into sperm or eggs um, in a variety of ways. Um, the other method, of course, is to um, directly introduce the genome editing components into the, into the very early embryo. Um, in this case, it's going to be far more difficult to verify that you have the edit you wanted to make and no others. Um, it's particularly going to be difficult if you have a, um, uh, a problem of mosaicism where not all the cells in the early embryo have been edited. Um, so uh, if you are, the only way to really show that you had uh, the correct edit in the embryo would be to take a biopsy to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But if you have a mosaic embryo, uh, where some cells are edited, some aren't, you don't actually know what your biopsy is. Was your biopsy of a, an edited cell or an unedited, unedited cell? Or, so that, that becomes a problem. Um, and currently, the methods uh, that we know of carry this risk of mosaicism, um, except it looks like if you really do introduce components very early after fertilization or during fertilization, then you may have reduced it down to, um, to, to it's not a problem. Um, all three um, genome editing approaches that I men have mentioned have now been done with early human embryos. So that's relying on the non-homology end joining, um, for example, Kath, my colleague Kathy's experiments. The homology di directed repair was done and was, was successful in a few cases in some experiments done in, in China. Um, and uh, the base editing, also experiments done in China, has been attempted, and it clearly worked. Not very efficiently, but it did work. Uh, these, these other studies didn't actually take the trouble to make the methods efficient. So that's why I'm saying I think we can improve the efficiency to really make it work. So the methods are still still not safe to use. Um, much more research is needed. However, uh, I think it, 
given the rate of um, change, the rate, the, how fast things are developing in the science, um, I think it, their methods will be made to work really efficiently and safely. Um, I should point out that there was a paper published towards the end of last year by Shukat, Metalipov and colleagues, uh, which claimed to have got homology-directed repair to work essentially 100% efficiently um, in, in human embryos. There's some doubt about this paper. Uh, he may not have actually corrected the gene mutation that was coming in from the father, but um, had so-called allele dropout, where actually he couldn't detect the mutant allele because there was a huge deletion. So he may have had this non-homology end joining process had worked instead, but actually led to huge deletions. And that he needs to um, uh, look again at all the data, which he's taking a long while to do. However, he introduced the components along with the sperm at fertilization, and you can conclude from his, his data that it was very efficient, so 100% in most cases. Um, so when might it be appropriate um, to use genome editing rather than alternative methods such as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis? Um, we're going to discuss these concerns on this slide, so I'll just mention them, but I'm sure we'll get there. Multi-generational risks, of course, but also possible benefits. A need for and possible difficulty of long-term follow-up. Um, lack of consent by affected persons, notably the future child. Um, the degree of intervention in nature. Uh, affecting acceptance of children born with disabilities. If you have a method you could use to stop that, um, will that cause a problem? Um, and a step towards enhancement of de for designer babies. Um, I could go through myself each of those and challenge them, but we'll do that later. Um, um, so the interest in doing this is because of literally thousands of, of inherited mutations. There are about 10,000 in simple inherited diseases. Um, so it would allow individuals to have genetic-related children without passing on a known risk of um, the genetic disease. However, in many cases, of course, you could use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, or prenatal diagnosis with selective termination. Now, I say in many cases, but also, of course, you can't do, use those techniques in several countries. So, again, you have to think where you, which country you're talking about uh, as well. Uh, and those methods are unacceptable for some individuals. Um, and there are cases where you can't actually use P PGD um, uh, to re retain a parental genetic connection, but avoid having a child with a genetic disease. And just to run through a few examples. So there are rare individuals who are homozygous for dominant mutations. So these are mutations where having just one copy gives you the disease. A classic example would be Huntington's disease, but there are many examples, other examples. So there are rare individuals in particular clusters in different parts of the world uh, where there are, say, clusters of, of individuals who are homozygous for Huntington's disease because that disease is very common in that particular area. They cannot have a child who is not going to get Huntington's disease. There are rare occasions uh, in, again, specific populations where both members of a couple could be homozygous for a recessive mutation. So that's where you need two copies mutated to give you the disease. There are cases where mutations affect fertility. So a woman gives rise to relatively few eggs and therefore relatively few embryos. And it becomes very difficult to do PGD to, to select uh, an embryo that's going to be free from disease. Uh, the so-called saviour siblings, where a, a couple decide to have a, they have a child already who is suffering from a, a disease that could be cured by, a, for example, a, a bone marrow transplant from a second child. This is so-called saviour siblings. Um, but actually, often it's a very inefficient process because if you have to select an embryo both for uh, to be missing the disease, genetic disease, and uh, to be a, an immune match to the existing child. It becomes very difficult. Um, genome methods, some people would argue that genome editing methods may in fact turn out to be more efficient and perhaps more reliable than PGD in some cases. Uh, 
and some people, they may be more acceptable, acceptable because you're not actually destroying any embryos, in, in theory. Uh, save your sibling, this is just one example very quickly. This is um, a, a group of families, uh, eight families, um, with a similar type of disease being studied in, in Harvard, um, going through this clinical process in Harvard. Um, and this gives you the sort of figures involved, eight families, of the whole program, they, they each had to undergo um, uh, multiple cycles, about five cycles uh, of IVF, which is a lot. Total number of oocytes retrieved, 524, embryos 299, all the way down to only one baby born who could be a savior sibling. Mm -hmm. So only one family had a savior sibling who could be used to rescue their, other, their first child. Very inefficient process. If you could have used genome editing to solve the genetic mutation problem, then you would have increased that efficiency. So I'm often asked which, which gene variants, which mutant alleles uh, might be relevant for correction via germline genome editing. It's very difficult to answer that question because you could say, well, it could be a common diseases um, such as cystic fibrosis, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, hypercholesterolemia, and all these others that are very common. Um, or it could be diseases that are generally very rare, but exist in clusters, um, uh, so high frequency in specific populations, and that would include things like Tay-Sachs, Huntington's. And so. um, but as I said, there are over, probably over 10,000 uh, single gene disorders. So my view is generally going to depend on who's standing in front of the clinician wanting to have a healthy child free of genetic disease. Um, an important point is to, to make is that as our ability to treat people who have genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, etc., improves through conventional treatments and also through somatic gene therapy using genome editing techniques often, there are going to be many more children surviving to reproductive ages with, with these diseases than we've had before. These, in, these individuals who now are able to have children, because they're old enough uh, and fertile, will uh, probably not want to pass on even a single abnormal copy of, of a gene to their children. So not now maybe, but in a generation's time, you will see a significant increase in the number of people for whom these techniques could be appropriate. Um, Quickly, um, the scary stuff, genetic enhancement. I'm not going to go through this list, really, but it gets more science fiction as you go down the list. You can read it. <laughs> you start off at the top, which, things, which is not enhancement at all. It's um, disease resistance, infectious disease, cancer. Uh, diets, perhaps manipulating people so they could eat different types of food is not, you know... Um, some aspects it might not be a form of enhancement if it's matching what most people can do. But if you want to alter diet so you could eat plastics, for example, then that probably is a form of enhancement. It might be a useful form of enhancement, but it's a form of enhancement. Um, and then you go all the way down. Many of these we could not do. We cannot even contemplate how to do them. So they are science fiction. Um, regulations become very important. Um, in many countries, it's illegal to, to try and do um, genome editing on, on an embryo or in, in, to make heritable changes. Uh, I should point out that making a heritable change doesn't mean it's going to be inherited necessarily, if, because, of course, the next generation you're going to segregate genes again, um, so it's not inevitable it's going to be subsequent generations, but it may be. Um, the U.S. is an interesting case uh, because... Um, if it wasn't for the fact that there is a small little rider put on an appropriations bill a couple of years ago that has to be renewed every year, it would, be, it would have been legal to do, um, make heritable changes using genome editing in many states in the U.S. Um, other countries vary, and we'll hear more about this later, uh, from prohibition, including much of Europe, to um, possible authorization under strict regulation, to no rules at all. Um, in the UK, it would require a change in primary legislation to allow it to happen. Um, 
If you're going to do trials of this, uh, of course, caution is needed, but I'm going to stress that being cautious does not mean prohibition, necessarily. Um, it might be permitted, this is, a report, this is from our report, um, after more research to meet existing risk-benefit uh, standards. Currently, uh, the, those standards are not met. It would need to be done under strict oversight. Um, and if, if the trials are restricted to specific sets of criteria, which includes absence of, alternat of reasonable alternatives, uh, restriction to prevention of a serious disease or condition, and one would expect that the first attempts would be the most severe, uh, highest risk conditions. Um, Editing only genes that have been convincingly demonstrated to cause or strongly predispose to the disease or condition. Uh, and then when you convert the gene to a normal version, what do you mean by a normal version? And we thought it was important, this was important to say that it should be one that's prevalent in the population um, and known to be associated with ordinary health, uh, not, no evidence of adverse effects, not to deliberately choose a very rare genetic variant say, from someone with huge muscles or, or whatever. To, that would be a sort of form of enhancement through the back door. Um, and then, of course, uh, available preclinical data so that it's likely to be safe. There has to be oversight, very important. There has to be follow-up, um, reassessment constantly of um, both health and societal benefits, um, a lot of participation from the public, uh, at every step, hopefully. Um, and so uh, reliable oversight mechanisms to prevent extension to uses other than preventing a serious uh, disease or condition. Um, and basically, you have to have appropriate and robust regulations um, and oversight. Uh, we argue very strongly that if they are not present, then you, should not, you do not have the authority to proceed trying to do this trials. There's still, of course, lots of questions. Um, the uses, what are the safest methods? We don't know yet. Um, I'm suspecting that in many cases it's going to be the base editing, but we'll see. The base editing has the advantage that um, the non-homology end joining, these other DNA repair mechanisms, cannot operate because you're not making a double strand breaking the DNA. Um, how can we avoid the problems associated with so-called rogue clinics um, offering unsafe, untested genome editing or, or somatic, uh, um, genome editing methods for somatic or heritable ones? Um, uh, this has been a huge problem in the stem cell therapy field. A lot of rogue clinics, basically clinics setting up to make lots of money from desperate patients, but actually not doing anything that's going to be effective and often doing things that are dangerous. Um, how can we obtain good understanding of views of patients and their families, not be swayed too much by dystopian views from science fiction? Um, how can we have good regulation, good oversight, which if done well should avoid trivial, unjust, or other uses that society as a whole deems unacceptable? And I'm going to stop just leaving this up here so you can contemplate um, dystopian views versus the, the opposite. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Again, let's show our appreciation, shall we please? Thank you, Robin. Thank you.